Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last event of the Political Theory Institute spring semester uh, lecture series. Uh, we've got a great event for you tonight. Um, before we begin, um, I just want to note that um, this is the last event, so come back uh, in the fall for more, more events. But I also want to remind you that this semester we've been celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Political Theory Institute uh, lecture series. And um, so I think this is, will be a great way to end that because it's on the theme that of uh, many of our lectures and many of our events over the years. But I have to give a big shout out to my colleague uh, and founding director of the Political Theory Institute, Alan Levine, who has uh, been the presiding spirit of this lecture series for a long time and has really made it possible for us to do what we're doing now. So um, thank you to Alan. And uh, I, uh, we're just really happy to be celebrating the 25th anniversary um, tonight. Uh, our event tonight is, the title is Democratizing the Great Books. Uh, our guest is Roosevelt Montas. Um, Roosevelt is uh, currently a fellow at Columbia, but um, for many years he was the director of the uh, core curriculum at Columbia, which is a, a famous and well-known uh, core curriculum program that uh, I think is uh, still distinctive in the world of uh, American higher education. Um, he's also the author of a forthcoming book, and Roosevelt, I want to make sure that I get the title right. Um, this, this book will be out from Princeton University Press uh, sometime uh, around the turn of the year, as I, as I understand it. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Change My Life and Why They Matter. Um, did I get that right, Roosevelt? Yep, got that right. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, and I should say, uh, you know, so many of us who have admired the Columbia core curriculum program, um, you know, and have admired Roosevelt's work, um, uh, you know, think it's really great what they do there. Um, I should say we're not having Roosevelt here primarily in his capacity as the person who has been in charge of that. Um, what, how the core curriculum works there, I think is distinctive to, to Columbia and not necessarily something that could be replicated at other institutions. So we're not having him here to tell us how we should do our business, we're, but um, we're having him here for the more important reason that he's, um, he's been a major spokesman for liberal education um, and has certainly somebody that I've admired for a long time. And so we're asking him here to talk about liberal education and about his work as the director of the core curriculum. Um, it, just to get us thinking about the issues that are involved in any such general education effort. So, um, so this, the spirit here is we're trying to think about general education, not replicate what Columbia is doing. I have to say that not simply for pro forma reasons, but because it's true. Um, so Roosevelt, um, thank you for being here and thank you for the work that you do. I'd just like to start with a question. Um, what do you, the phrase democratizing the great books that, um, Somebody, I, I, perhaps it was you, and perhaps it was me, chose the title <laughs> Democratizing the Great Books. Can you tell us what do you think that means? Um, uh, thank you, Tom. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here before I talk about that phrase. Um, as you will know, we had originally planned this event for last year, and it was uh, derailed by uh, an act of, uh, I don't know, viral reproduction. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. I obviously wish we were together in person. Um, I just, I've just come up from a really stimulating hour with, with students. Made me wish I was there in person. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and to be having this long postponed occasion. Um, democratizing the, the great books, you know, you can obviously read that phrase in a lot of ways, um, the way in which it makes most sense to me, or the way I, I well, you know, what where my mind goes when I when I see that phrase, and what I thought when I saw the when I saw the phrase as as a, the title for this event, is that the great books have historically, in one way or another, been the exclusive or largely, primarily, the province of a kind of social educated elite. Um, and that holds true of, of liberal education. And the great books have always played a central role in liberal education, even in places that don't have a formal great books program. 
um, liberal education, great texts, um, even texts that are not canonical, um, are just superb tools for liberal education. And they have been, um, like liberal education, largely the province of the social of, of a social elite. So in democratizing the, re, the great books, uh, what I think of is the, the idea, the aspiration, the intention to make great book based liberal education accessible to the broad population, uh, bringing more and more people to encounter uh, to grapple with, to think about, discuss the great books. Um, in some way, the history of American higher education has been a history of broader, of democratizing liberal education. Um, probably the biggest single step is uh, after the 1945 GI Bill that brought a just an entire population that were not the kind of people who went to college. College was 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 um, not for for regular people. Um, but we have taken other steps. You know, the 1965 um, Higher Ed Act and other policies, sometimes spearheaded by some rich private institutions, have tell the story of of, of broadening, democratizing access to liberal education and to great book space, liberal education. I, I should say that that process has gone into reverse. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, the last 20 years have not continued to see that expansion, but rather a contraction, a uh, contraction that's driven by, by, by very large forces and which strikes me as one of the um, real dangers of our moment and, and going forward is that liberal education becomes again um, confined to those who are already privileged and those who are already um, those who already have access to to cultural capital. So democratizing the great books means to me getting this education, making this type of education accessible to more and more people, particularly people that have traditionally been excluded from access to it. Okay, so that makes it sound like there's a good that you want to share with more people. Um, but as you know, uh, many people will ask the question about the nature of the good itself, right, or the thing itself. Um, what do you say to people who say that that the the kinds of um, traditions and the kind of programs that that you uh, have been involved in um, are insufficiently diverse or insufficiently inclusive, and that in our changing time that that uh, what we teach needs to radically change as well? Um, that, that's a that's a big question, right? Um, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Often, you know, many faculty, right? So students and faculty both will raise. So what would yeah. you say to that? Yeah. You know, it's a, first I would want to point out that it's a legitimate question for us to ask, an important question for us to ask. Um, it's a question that I faced constantly as director of the Columbia Corps and um, as a person of color who is a, you know, not uh, from an elite background. Um, it's a question I face. So it's an important question because we have seen, we have seen um, places of exclusivity be open to, you know, to, 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 to broader, broader people in all spheres of uh, of American life and, and probably goes beyond America, um, financial and political, educational, um, you know, in the arts, et cetera. And that is salutary. And that is the result of sustained and dedicated labor and activism and struggle. Um, and it, it, there's a kind of certain obvious logic to us bringing that, I, that, that, that impulse and that aspiration for diversity and representation and democratization to something like the canon. Um, but I think that once you get, once you dig kind of deeper into the logic, you begin to see problems. Um, so, you know, the, 
the logic of representation, I think, works and it's appropriate in a kind of in, in a political field. It makes sense for our representative institutions, political institutions, Congress, um, and you know, legislatures of all kinds, to represent the people that elect that elect them. The the, the to represent along all kinds of identitarian uh, axes to represent the people. When you bring that thinking to a curriculum, um, it's really apples and oranges. So a curriculum could be representative of, you know, a given time period. You know, we're going to read representative plays from the, I don't know, 1850s or something, or it could be representative along a genre. Um, but the idea of using our contemporary diversity as the standard by which to select curricula just leads to incoherence and, and kind of tokenism. Um, the criterion by which we choose the works that we study um, Cannot, cannot be a criterion that is extrinsic to the works that we study. Um, it it doesn't, doesn't add up. So um, what criteria should we use? And you know, there are, I think, many ways of thinking about that. But any criteria that you use that is temporally expansive, that is any criteria that you use that is going to include the sweep of textual history. And let's let's talk loosely now about the Western tradition, although this will be true of any of any textual tradition. If you take a brick a, a big broad sweep, then that means that a large part of that curriculum is not good diversity of the kind that we value today is not going to be available there. There are not going to be many women writers. There are not going to be people of color. Um, there are not going to be any poor people. Um, they're not going to be disabled people. They're not going to be, uh, or there are going to be very few kind of marginal presence of gender non-conforming people, et cetera. All kinds of diversity that we value and celebrate today um, are going to be missing for, for a lot of the textual history by virtue of the historical conditions under, under which they were produced. Those people did not have access to the tools of intellectual creation. Now, when you get closer to the present, um, you know, say post World War II, then you do have a tremendous diversity. And I think any curriculum um, that takes into account that, that significantly covers the post World War II period, um, unless, um, you know, unless it's 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 uh, deliberately shaped otherwise, it's going to include many of these diverse voices: um, women writers, writers of color, writers that come from marginalized backgrounds, writer, writers that speak about the experience of people that have been traditionally um, exploited and and oppressed. Um, you're going to have that. So often, I shift the conversation about representation. To the time frame that we are that, that we're that we're looking at. One one more thing I want to say that I think applies to almost everything we're saying, or everything that I that I am saying and will say tonight. I'm thinking here about general education, right? If you are teaching the English major, there's a whole different set of criteria by which you choose. If you are teaching physics, there's a whole different criteria that by which you choose. Or if you're teaching African American literature, or if you or if you're teaching moral philosophy. So I'm talking here about general education. That is the kind of education that we think ought to be the basis of every college education. That is the, that, that portion of the student's education that is not dedicated to the major, to specialization, to professionalization, but the portion of the student's education that is meant to address the student as a, as a, as a kind of emerging human free agent in our society. Well, so um, okay, so so I we'll we'll talk, I suspect, later more about the criteria by which you think about the books, which books to teach. But um, so sometimes I've heard you speak, and you go, um, you say something uh, a little bit different from what you just said. I mean, not contradictory, but but a little bit different, 
which is that um, that you think that liberal education, which includes some of these core texts that that you were just talking about, that liberal education is is um, uh, not opposed to diversity amongst the students. In fact, it might be good for diversity amongst the students. That it might be something that students of all kinds of backgrounds can benefit from, and and should benefit from. I mean, that goes to your 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 the point that you began with about democratizing the great books. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that aspect? Yeah. And, and maybe um, and so since I've had the the privilege of reading some of your your manuscript. Talk about your experience because you are, came up through the Columbia Core curriculum program, yeah. right? You're, yeah. you're not just a, the president; you're also a, a customer. The, <laughs> yeah, that right. That's right. Yeah, um, you know, one I, I think when one thinks about education, one necessarily uses one's own experience as a as a reference, um, and and I certainly do. Um, I. I'm an immigrant to the United States from the Dominican Republic. So I came to the US when I was 12, um, not speaking English, not coming from um, a family that went to college or that was um, uh, well resourced in any way with poor immigrants. And um, that was in the, into the seventh grade. Then I uh, ended up by almost by accident um, going to Columbia for college. Um, I was I was in New York, and um, just did well enough in school and had learned barely enough English to get an SAT score that kind of sneaked me into Columbia, not knowing what I was getting into. And Columbia, is, as as Tom said, has this mammoth core curriculum that sometimes is described as a great books program. We at Columbia don't describe it as a great books program. For one thing, there are courses in music and, and, and art, which are not about books. Um, but the what people generally understand by great books program adequately describes much of the Columbia program. So I, I landed there and began to read these books and to talk about them with students whose life experiences and world perspectives were fundamentally uh, different than mine. We were, just, we were just shaped by social conditions, um, cultural conditions that were so, so different. Uh, so, th so there I am reading these books and talking about them uh, with students and teachers. And I, and, and, and I found that many of the books spoke to me in a very, very deeply and transformative way. Um, they, they, gave me tools for self-exploration, for self-knowledge, um, for understanding of the world that were immensely valuable to me. And that had nothing to do with them sharing my particular kind of socioeconomic, historical, ethnic background. It was, it was, not, it was not because Homer shared anything, any of that with me that I found Homer uh, illuminating and transformative or, or Shakespeare or Montaigne or, or Cervantes for that matter. Um, they, they, they did something else. They, 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 they illuminated my humanity in terms that were, that were broader than that. Um, and, you know, that I had, you know, people who were like Italian Americans in my class and Dante did not speak to them in a special way because they were Italian American. Um, so that experience was like exhibit A in in the in my thinking or or an important foundational insight in my thinking about the fact that part of what makes a book um, great in the way that 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 is useful for liberal education for general liberal education part of what makes a book great in that way is precisely its capacity to transcend the specific historical conditions of its production and speak beyond that. Um, I was telling the class earlier today that the reason why Montaigne speaks powerful to me is not because of his male 16th century Frenchness. Um, it is exactly in the ways in which what, in, in which what he says 
is accessible and illuminates my experience as a Dominican immigrant to the United States. That's what makes Montaigne uh, a powerful, a great work in that context. Um, once you are able to construct a learning situation around texts like this, and then you put people in the same room who come from diverse backgrounds, um, I think you have there the most powerful kind of liberal education that can be had. Um, many of our campuses, you know, we, we, I think in general in higher education care a lot about diversity. And even though we are constantly flagellating ourselves for our failures to live up to what our ideals and, and aspirations are, and we absolutely do fail to live up to them. Um, by and large, we value diversity and, and diversity in this, you know, ethnic diversity, socioeconomic diversity, religious diversity, sexual identity and all kinds of identities diversity. We know that that stuff brings us strength. We know that that stuff enriches everyone's, everyone's experience in a community. But many times in our campuses, students come with, you know, very diverse student body and they will boast of, you know, the, 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 their diversity. But then those students self-segregate. They take similar classes, they join similar clubs or similar or, or the same teams, the same, the same uh, lounges, the same, the same eating places. They form um, largely isolated subcultures. Often it happens, not, not always, but that, that, that happens often. A classroom in which people can come together from these different little spheres and talk about fundamental issues. It's one of the primary ways in which we as institutions can exploit the promise of diversity. The, one of the primary, probably the most productive way in which we can harness the power and ed educational value of diversity is precisely by creating the conditions in, in which these diverse presences in our campuses can come together and talk about fundamental issues, talk about um, the, the, the issues that concern us by virtue of our common humanity, um, by virtue of our presence in a shared social, political, historical moment now. So uh, to, two thoughts uh, based on what you just said. Number one, diversity is a strength, but only when the diversity is somehow in conversation with yeah. other kinds of diversity. Yeah. And so you need something, something, some shared thing, some shared yeah. space in which to have those things come together. And then the other thing, of, so, and what, you know, I, I want to talk about the details of the way that the core curriculum program works, but the thing about the, the books, I mean, it seems to me that, that maybe, would you agree with this, that a definition of a work that would work, a book that would work well, or a text that would work well in this context, would be something that has a kind of moral complexity in it, and that it has layers, and that different people will see different things legitimately, and that it provides a kind of space in which one would have to work out. And so I think of something like Homer's Iliad, which I just taught for the first time. Um, Congratulations. That, uh, well, it's 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 challenging to everyone, right? I mean, the, the amount of gore that you have to wade through. Um, but uh, but I mean, is is Homer uh, is he pro Achilles or anti Achilles? That, that's not that's not immediately clear. Yeah. Right? yeah. And and, so, and there's yeah. good there's good evidence on both sides of that question, and 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 that and to think about that sort of forces you to work through, like, why would somebody be in favor of Achilles, and why would somebody be a critic of Achilles? Yeah. Yeah. And that, but that course, that conversation is more about us, right? That the, yes. the, the tech is a kind of Rorschach test that, that yes. we have to, um, so, but it's that right. quality of moral complexity that seems to me that so, somehow there's some kind of intro yeah. diversity of within the book. Within the book. I absolutely agree with you. Um, one, one aspect of this moral complexity that books have is that is, or that a book that's great for this purpose of liberal education, common liberal education is that they're not reducible to ideological messaging. They're not reducible to propaganda. They do not lend themselves to, uh, you know, to, 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 to conversion to a party, to conversion to an ideology, because they have that, that complexity. They, they are kind of balanced in the great questions. Um, they stimulate thinking, they stimulate conversation. They do, not, um, they do not give you answers. They give you deep 
questions or they deepen the questions that you have. Um, it's one. It's one of the qualities, and, and you know, you can, and many many people have attempted to kind of draw the ten, you know, ten criteria by which you're going to judge these books, and you know, one of them might be moral complexity, and the other one might be like um, uh, accessibility to an undergraduate. Another one might be like aesthetic quality, or another one might be just the influence this text has had on a tradition. Another one might be like how old is this book. Uh, another one it might be, does this book bring up issues that nobody else brings up and that are really important? So whatever, you can have, you can have a list of criteria. And, and I, I know programs that have such a list and give scores to the books and then they add up the scores and okay, this is a 25 right. book and we're gonna include everything over 20 in this, this year. The metrics of the great books world. Uh, exactly, so you know, you can certainly do that and, and uh, just, just don't, believe your categories too much or don't believe that your categories uh, encompass everything that there is. Um, uh, Wittgenstein in, in the philosophical investigations has introduces this concept that's just so useful of a family resemblance uh, where, you know, you see like people in a family and they kind of resemble each other, but it's not like you can't reduce it to a formula, um, but they are related by a, by a, a kind of set of characteristics that overlap in some uncodifiable way uh, cannot it, it, and and I think the way we think about a great book is kind of like that there are there are this there's this there's a family resemblance there is you know you've got these um, qualities or measurements or or ways in which the book is significant that kind of come together and make them an excellent tool to do what to do what we're doing, and and that's not eternal. That's not eternally the case. You know, there there are books. You know, I don't know. You can you can you can go through the canon and think about you know John Donne, whatever. Every every educated person read a lot of John Donne, or there was no educated person that had not read Paradise Lost. You know, Milton or something. And and then you know, then those books sometimes fall out of currency in some way, and then whatever, in 50 years, there's a huge Milton revival. Now everybody's reading Milton. So there is a kind of historical sensitivity to it. There are, there are works that depending on the context, depending on the, on the historical conditions will gain saliency. And, and again, it's very hard to say, to reduce them or to nail them. I was, I was, one of the questions that came up in the class is the idea of a list of books, you know, of a canon and there isn't there isn't a list it's a or it's a very porous list it's a it's a it's a it's a um, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a it, it isn't an essence that makes a great book a great book I mean, th it, there's a danger for for people who do the kind of work that i think we both do that you do that the the, the list becomes a, a signal or of a certain social status right, right. that that's the right. perpetual danger that uh, somehow this like this project would get taken over by a kind of oligarchy, right? Or at least right. it would be an oligarchy. And maybe to, 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 so let me ask you this. So based on what you've just said about, about the books and, and about the fact that the list changes, right? That, that uh, I think yeah. what you're, what you're really looking for is a book that will uh, be able to speak to the students that you have, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's an important question that it's not just here are these, you know, statues that are on the wall, but it's about the conversation that could, that does happen or could happen with the students. Right. Um, but that, uh, I guess what you're really trying to do is, is encourage maybe by showing by example, a kind of ethos um, that, that reading the books could help people to practice, but it's yeah. not, you know, there used to be like the Harvard five set, you know, five foot shelf right. of like the great right. books and show that you're a smart person because you read all of them. But that's that's kind of the contrary to what you're saying. Yes, um, it, 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 it is the contrary to what we're to, to what I'm saying. And as much as there isn't there isn't an ultimate list, there isn't. I mean, if you you can publish, you know, you, you can publish a series of um, that will be really useful, really valuable, um, and contain a lot of books that that are like that. Um, but one, you know, it's not something that you can fix. It's not something that you can nail down. Another, another kind of wrinkle of this is that I'm, I'm 
completely convinced that you can teach a, a, a good liberal arts course or do a good liberal arts education just using contemporary sources, just reading contemporary sources. Um, sure, there will be something that you gain if you look at ancient texts that you're not going to, that you're going to be missing, um, but you can do it. Um, so that's, you know, when you were, when you started speaking about, this is not about trying to import the Columbia model. I, I have said before that if I, if I could implement the Columbia model everywhere, I wouldn't. Um, I probably wouldn't implement it anywhere um, <laughs> besides Columbia. Um, but every institution I think will draw on its own values, its own traditions, its own resources, its own configuration, you know, like a, if an, an, an HBCU, for example, in their core curriculum um, would probably have a, a concentration, you know, concentration of the African-American voices, that's not going to be the same at Columbia or, or some other school that doesn't have those roots, doesn't have those values, doesn't have that mission, doesn't have that in its DNA. Um, so there is a, a contextual variability, I think, even to the choice of old, of old books. Um, and I kind of a further wrinkle on that is that while you can, I think, do a decent liberal education just reading contemporary sources, the thing that you are missing is not a small thing. Um, that, that, that there is a very profound and unique value into understanding the ways in which the categories through which we understand the contemporary world have evolved. The fact that the categories that we use, the conventions that we use, the normative understandings that frame our thinking have a history, have evolved, are not, uh, are not freestanding. Understanding that, and that applies to our institutions, our laws, our morals, our um, uh, conventions of every type. Understanding that I think adds a, an element to liberal education that is really, really powerful and really, really important. So even though I say you can, you can do a liberal education without that, it's not something insignificant that you're missing if you don't spend time with the old, the old folks. Right. Um... So well, so uh, before we go on too much further, I should just uh, remind the audience that uh, we will be moving to a, a question and answer period, uh, probably in about 15 minutes. So if you have questions, I see some questions already popping up, but we're using the Q&A feature. Uh, and so I encourage you to ask questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, Roosevelt, I wonder if you could, so one thing I'm interested about the core, the core curriculum at Columbia, uh, so there's the content question, which we've just been talking about. There's a lot more that could be said about that. But one thing I'm particularly interested in is the form, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in the epilogue of your manuscript, you talk about, you sort of describe the core curriculum and you have a section on the form. And I wonder if you could, mm -hmm. and I wonder if it might not be the case that, that the form is actually in some ways more radical than the content. Uh -huh. Uh, and I'm yeah. not sure if you would agree with that, but but I wonder if you could uh, walk us just talk. What does a what does a class look like? How does the program work? Yeah, um, these kinds of practical questions. I think yeah, open bigger things. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So form, you know, form form is 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 hugely important. Um, and a couple of things a couple of things go into into that the way we do it at Columbia. One is that the classes are are small um, and driven by conversation. I, you know, liberal education cannot happen except through a recognition of the autonomy of the people who are in, who are, who are the subjects of liberal education. That is liberal education is an exercise in freedom. Uh, so that cannot happen except in a conversational and intimate space. Um, so you need, you need small classes. It also means as far as form that you, um, the, the teacher in the classroom is not the ultimate authority or the, that is, is not the ultimate epistemological authority and is not the ultimate resource, uh, source of information. 
the teacher comes into the classroom not as an expert but as a kind of amateur as a kind of guide into a conversation that is that is that is uh, a shared exploration with the students um at Columbia, we have also a strong commitment to commonality. That is that the whole, the whole first year class and then the whole second year class as a cohort are going, are, are taking the same course. So, you know, whatever, in the literature course, we have 64 sections or something, 60 odd sections, each one of them about 20 students strong with an instructor following a common syllabus. So first week of September, everybody's reading the Iliad, the whole, first year class, every entry, uh, first year student. And every sophomore is reading the Republic um, in, in their, the course that they're taking. Um, that provides a um, degree of a, a commonality of intellectual experience. Um, a, you know, it, it connects the senior with the first year student and whoever your crazy roommate is that you have as a first year student they're going to be taking literature humanities too and 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 you're going to have something to talk about and something to share about um so these these aspects of the way that the thing is organized the way in which it's delivered um are critical are, are critical to it delivering the powerful experience that that, that model delivers Tom, did you have, are there, are there other, you've, you've looked at this more recently than I have. Uh, are there other aspects of the form that, 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 that struck, struck you? Well, so I'm, so I'm interested. So I, well, I mean, just the thing about the yeah. discussion format, I mean, it, it just, um, you know, the architecture of classrooms um, often sends a powerful message about how we understand what's happening in that classroom. And, yeah. and you know, many classrooms and many universities are set up on the solar system model right, where you, the faculty member, are the sun that is shedding the light, putting the light into the unformed minds, and, and, um, and that, and so, and all the students look at you, rather mm -hmm. than looking at something in the middle that, right, whereas a seminar table, um, everyone comes to the seminar, everyone sits, and, and there's a kind of equality of simply being around the table, uh, and, but I think that's meant to um, silently, perhaps, but, but embody the message that we come to the table as equals, that I might have read this book more times than the students have, but I haven't mastered it. I, um, you know, there are things that I see that are like leads that I'm trying to pursue, but that we're all trying to pursue in, in common right. conversation. So right. that part, you know, it's, it's yeah. important. And, and, you know, it's one of the ways in which general education or liberal education is different than disciplinary education. Um, you know, even if you are in a liberal arts discipline, when you teach, when you're teaching your majors, you're teaching them a, a specialized body of knowledge in which you are an expert. Um, when you walk into a liberal arts classroom, you don't walk in there as an expert. And you know, like you are teaching Homer's Iliad. Um, and so do I teach Homer's Iliad. And you know, and, and I'm not teaching it from a position of expertise. I am teaching from I'm teaching it from a position of curiosity. I'm teaching it from a position of uh, kind of experience. I have a as a reader, as a thinker, I have a certain kind of experience. I have tools to draw on. So I'm bringing all of this into my reading and the students are bringing their, their equivalent set of, of, of kind of skills. And we are gonna throw it all together to try to make sense of this work. And so it's so important that the teacher in a liberal arts classroom maintains something like I don't know what Zen people call a beginner's mind. Um, there's a, this famous saying, the, the mind from, it's from Suzuki, from Suzuki Roshi in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, that fascinating little book he has, that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities in the experts, there are a few. Um, it's so crucial for the liberal arts teacher to teach with that kind of non-expert orientation. I find that the closer I get to my expertise, the harder it is for me to teach it in a liberal arts context. You know, when in, in the sophomore course at Columbia that I that I teach, one of the sections is on on the American Revolution, uh, which is one of my fields, my my areas of specialty, and it's incredibly hard. I I am like muscle bound. I I've got too much stuff. I I know too much. I've got too many. 
you, you want to be the well things. actually guy you want to the yeah. guy that's, well, actually that's just completely wrong exactly it's just it's just it makes it harder it's 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 a, it's a situation in which having more information doesn't help in the endeavor and in fact i mean some information you know there's a that you can't exaggerate that point um but it is a situation in which adding more information and more expertise does not help. Oh, yeah. Let, let me ask about another aspect of the form that I think is important, which is the commonality. And, and it seems to me that this is, um, so you talked about in terms of students, right? But it also means commonality in terms of faculty. And it's my observation from having been around general education for a while and different, different institutions in different forms, that, that oftentimes the real obstacle to general education is the fact that faculty don't agree with each other. Or have a hard time agreeing with each other, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it would, you know, whatever one might want in the abstract, it would, might be hard to do something like the Columbia Common Core just because we don't have any consensus. And and but more importantly, yeah. right? There's there's a lack of trust in the world, right? Yeah. That it's, I don't know, yeah. it's nobody's fault, but it's just the the reality of the the world that we live in. Um. And I and so I, but it seems to me that the commonality is actually a really powerful thing, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, for students because we live in this kind of meritocratic society in which everything's competitive. And we often feel that we have to be getting a certain score and you know, progressing in life, which tends to push us away from, from each other. But I think even more for the faculty, right? I mean, I think that faculty yeah. need something. Yeah. And, and we often feel demoralized. The only way that we actually in, interact with each other is by complaining, right? This is the universal human condition, right? So, um, and of course the administration, right? The administration is the universal object of all complaints just because that's the way the universe is always set up, right? <laughs> Regardless of who the poor administrator is. Um, but that we we need something that we can do together that, that you know, reminds us of the things that we look up to. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, I think even about, yeah. It might've been Clark, Clark or something who said like I think it was describing university maybe in California but that it was a, a group of researchers united by common grievance over <laughs> parking spaces um, <laughs> there is there is something to that in in most schools do their general education their liberal education through distribution requirements you know we and and it's it what that means is students are given a kind of recipe, take two courses of this kind and three of those and five of these. Um, and um, then, you know, you, you, you put it together, distribution requirements. Sometimes the courses that meet distribution requirements, the criteria for a distribution requirement in general, in general education has nothing to do with content. It's exclusively competencies. You know, you do, you do critical thinking, you do clear writing, you do expression, you do this, you do that, numeracy, boom. If your course meets those, learning goals that that does it um a shift and, and and that shift both from common requirements to distribution requirements and from content to competencies both of those are expressions of what daniel bell writing about the core curriculum at columbia called an admission of intellectual defeat he, he thought that that distribution requirements were an admission of intellectual defeat what is the admission is the in, inability of or unwillingness of um, or incapacity of faculty to agree on what is most worth knowing for an undergraduate. And rather than have the debates and rather than try to forge an agreement, we've just decided, you know what, we will all just go and do our thing. I will teach a version of my little specialty that fulfills the general education requirements and I'll write up the syllabus and include the language that the committee on instruction said that I need to include. And uh, I'll go and do my own thing and nobody will know what I'm doing and I will never know what the other person is doing. Um, as opposed to a commitment by faculty, and this is not a crazy thing, you know, a commitment by faculty to say, you know what, in these courses that are not in my, for my for majors, they're general education courses, we are going to put some effort into coming up with a consensus of things that we think matter. And if, if faculty take that step and are willing to give up some of their autonomy, you know, we, we academic freedom is like a sacred cow or something. But um, the other day I was, I was speaking to faculty at Lehman College, a, 
uh, City College in, in New York is extraordinarily diverse and has an amazing faculty. And I likened coming together to create a common curriculum as a kind of Rousseauian social contract where you as a faculty member give up some degree of freedom of autonomy, not to some administrator or some state board, you give up a degree of, a, of, intellect, of, of pedagogical curricular autonomy in exchange for other faculty members giving up the exact same degree of autonomy and creating a space in which the content will express some kind of general will, some kind of sense that we're in this, we're trying to do something for the undergraduate. Um, is there common ground that we can, that, that we can build on? Um, and if faculty had those conversations, I think a lot of common ground would emerge. And, and it doesn't need to be like the whole, you know, general education faculty, three faculty members, five faculty members, 10 faculty members can come together and say, you know, can we, if we agree that it is a general desirable thing to have some degree of commonality, which we already do because we have common learning goals and we have common point systems, all kinds of commonalities. If there is any value in extending this commonality to a commonality of content when our goal has to do with general education, can we? Can we reach some degree of commonality? I think, and I think that, that there is a lot more that could be achieved if people, if people were just willing and I don't know, courageous enough to have the conversations. Nobody's going to force you to teach anything, but there's probably a lot of a, a lot of stuff that we can agree on. You know, well, can we agree fun. that, you know, whatever? Can we agree that in the in the wake of Eric Garner and BLM two last summer, five of us can come together and agree on a couple of texts that we think are going to be important for undergraduates to read now, and we probably can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was going to say, Roosevelt, I'm not sure. It sounds to me like at uh, Columbia that it's more of a, I mean, it sounds like you have like a sort of equivalent of an established religion, right? Which which is in a way is great, right? It's like a, uh, but I guess my ambition would be to more have like little dissenting sex, right? That works. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and so we, we are going to go to questions here in just a second. Um, so I, I think Gabe is going to start giving us questions. But, but I want to, so just a point on the commonality thing. I mean, you see this, it's, so this is not an individual problem, right? This is not that individual right. faculty and there are differences over what text that should be taught. And that, that's actually really healthy conversation to have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the whole idea that you would simply teach, everyone would teach the same thing that would be picked by some, you know, English professor from 1950, like that's really a disaster. But, um, but this, this cultural thing that makes it hard for us to talk about things that we do in common together, it shows up in other parts of the academic life. And I'm thinking, especially of evaluating teaching, right? Yeah. So we, we have a model, and I think it's shared across the country, where the, the main way that we institutionally evaluate teaching is by student, those student scores at the end of the term. Wish. Yeah. And um, I think students don't quite realize that that's like almost the only way that the institution really thinks about evaluating teaching. And that for many of our colleagues who are not on the tenure track, uh, who, and that's a number that keeps getting bigger and bigger, that's actually a really big deal, right? Like those yeah. scores yeah. Um, can determine whether or not you're going to get hired again the next year. And that I think encourages faculty to, to be less daring and less um, sort of active in their, in their teaching and, and try to stay extremely safe. Yeah. Um, but it just, it shows, it always seems to me such a institutional failure that um, what, I mean, how do the students know, right? I mean, my favorite w question of those was, um, is your professor an expert in their field? <laughs> how in the world <laughs> do students possibly know? Like, like that's the, by definition the question. Like, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a failure of us faculty to be willing to look each other in the face and say, I think this works and I think this doesn't work. Right. Right. Um, but there's there's kind of a, a failure of the community, right? That's yeah. the, the thing that strikes me as so important. And, and the structure, as is often the case, where uh, you know the whatever tragedy of the commons or, or or collective problems are facilitated by particular by particular institutional collective structures in the academy, the way it's structured, it does not. There is no space for general education. General education, you know, there is no department of general education usually, or 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 um, 
general education is cobbled together by picking people whose careers and whose promotions and whose prestige and whose professional identity is entirely based on their disciplinary specialty. And you pull them out to do this other thing that's general education. Um, is it really a surprise that what you're gonna end up is not, you know, is not uh, of the highest quality? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to start asking you some questions from the, the chat. So um, here's a question from David Fott, who is a political theorist. Um, if we pursue the laudable goal of democratizing the great books in the sense that you mentioned, how should we approach teaching great books that are anti-democratic? Well, I think you know, in the same way that we approach teaching books that are democrat that are pro-democratic, um, the questions that that these books address are are human questions. Um, they are questions on which um, the authors don't have privileged insight. Um, so, in fact, you know, I think I think that I think that books that that are anti-democratic or that raise questions about the democracy are really really important because we have such a strong cultural consensus for democracy. And um, if only for the reason that, as you know. Mel points out on liberty, if you don't have to defend your views, they just ossify into dogmas. Um, so I think, you know, books like that are, are really important that we read. Um, but that question, you could push that question further, you know, what, what about books that are racist? Or what about books that, um, you know, dehumanize or or demonize certain um groups or something um what about those books should we be reading you think there are books that are racist <laughs> um yeah i think that there are there are great books that are racist um that is uh racism as a as a as a, as a paradigm Infil can infiltrate or can color, can shape any, you know, thinkers who um, might not even be writing about race. Um, so how can I put this? If you, if you use non-racism as a necessary criterion for choosing a book that you teach, it's um, it's a losing battle. You, you you're not gonna find you're not gonna find books that are completely against which that case cannot be made. Um, but to get to this question of you know, what about books that support morally reprehensible positions, things that just fundamentally go against our shared values? Um, well, there is a line somewhere. There is a line somewhere when we, as a community, are going to say, "No, we're not that that that." There's more. There, there's more rotten material in that apple than edible parts, so we're not going to teach that. But, uh, but again, that gets on the list, right? There are many, many yes. things that are left out. Yes, right? exactly, exactly. Yeah. You're not an advocate. Um, at least you're not an advocate here for complete free speech on this on no. the syllabus of a it's class a, like right. this. Right. It's, it's It's unworkable. Uh, yeah. But this gets back that, to this question about, about um, forging consensus or commonality, like having those debates, and we just, we don't have those debates, but having those debates about, you know, um, can, how far do we go? You know, what this particular book, you know, who, does this book, is this book acceptable to us? Or, um, should we, whatever it is, should we teach us like having the debate in which the merits and drawbacks of any particular choice can be aired. It's just so important. It's just something that we don't have a context in which to do. We don't have a context in which to, you know, I'm uh, American intellectual historian. I don't have a context normally in which to talk to a philosopher about that. Um, and general education is the place where that conversation can happen. Right. I'm gonna ask some questions from students now. 
um, Emma Saman, a student at American University, asks, when speaking of the moral complexity of the great books, do you think the, sorry, but the, uh, uh, it's like texting, it updates, and you lose your, <laughs> when speaking the moral complexity of the great books, do you think the way we read them reveals our own moral sentiments, or do they force us to reevaluate them? Does it depend on the reader or maybe even the teacher? Um, yeah, I think it does both. It both reflects our, our, our kind of moral lenses, but I think if we read them in the way that, that you read and discuss a text in a liberal arts classroom, it also has a capacity to challenge and even transform those, those lenses. Um, a lot does have to do with how it's treated in the classroom. And, and this is, you know, this is one of the, I don't know if, if Achilles heel is the right way to put it, but it's one of the peculiarities of liberal education that it depends a lot on the teacher. Um, it is for good and for ill, a kind of personality driven enterprise. You are there and you are by a teacher, by your approach, by your demeanor, by your openness, by your exercise, by your enthusiasm, um, by your own process of in front of your students and with your students grappling with fundamental questions that don't have easy answers. Um, that, that does the education. That is a critical part of the education. So um, you can read, well, you know, in, in, in the case of Columbus, I was saying, if you take one of the two big big courses that have 60 plus sections each and are reading the same books, people have radically different experiences of those classes. They're reading the same books um, with the same size class, 20 students or whatever. Um, yet people can have just really fundamentally different experiences. Some people come out transformed. Some people come out feeling that they have wasted their time. Um, some people come out feeling that they have been, you know, bruised or sometimes even traumatized by some of the stuff that they encountered. Um, so same books. Um, this, this, this points to, you know, pedagogy is absolutely central in this endeavor. And of course, we know that that's not something you get trained in. You don't go to graduate school. You don't get, you don't, you don't get taught how to teach. Uh, you're in some of in some of the best programs. You're even taught not to teach. Um, so, what a teacher is able to do in the classroom with the books, with the discussion, is absolutely critical to the education. So, um, and to this to this question about to what extent do we simply impose our moral categories and judgments on the thing that we read and to what extent those judgments and categories are formed or challenged by the book you read. The teacher has a lot to do with what, how much of that happens in the classroom. Right. Okay, another question from a student. This is Joshua Suchek, who's um, one of our Lincoln Scholar students. So um, shout out to Josh. Josh asks, uh, isn't the role of the university, at least in its education branch, to serve the student? And if so, isn't a curriculum built on student choice better? It allows for self-selection of courses that fill and extend their interest. Furthermore, isn't it illiberal to force students into any core curriculum? Um, we can try to argue that students could choose to go someplace else, but universities serve other forces and have a monopoly on our future. Consequentially, even if a forced curriculum is epistemologically better, doesn't it fail as someone getting something out of a course is idiosyncratic and probably optimized by giving them more choice? So why not more choice? Great. Yeah, great. There's so many good questions uh, and assumptions embedded there. Um, let me say a word about part of the beginning of the question about aren't universities there for for teaching students? So that that that's a big the answer to that is not clear at all. Um, I mean, I wish universities, um, colleges maybe, you know, the idea of college is to shape and, and equip an individual and kind of cultivate and nourish the development of an individual. Universities, you know, what we usually mean is a research university and the mandate there is about the generation and dissemination 
of knowledge, uh, which is a different thing. The discipline, the knowledge, the, 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 the research enterprise is uh, dominates and it dominates the uh, deal research university and there's a tension between that and, and the teaching mission and in most universities the bigger and more prominent they are the more the 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 equation is stacked against teaching um so that that's one thing to say that but but back to the question of students of, of student choice um one can you know one, one can debate that but i i think that Part of the responsibility of a faculty member, part of what the job of a faculty member is, is to present the student with some deliberate and well-informed account of what is most worth knowing. Um, and that's something that you do when you take a class with a professor, um, even a class that you choose because the subject matters to you or the, it interests you or for whatever reason, you make the choice. But when you go and you stand there, the professor makes the choice of what texts, um, what questions, what assignments, what structure is going to best deliver the thing that, they, uh, that they're trying to do in the course. So you walk in there having made your choice and then you made the, the choice implies subjecting yourself to the expert judgment of someone else. Um, that is inevitable. So the logic of choice, if you push it to its logical extension, it's just going to get you no professors where you just, you go into the class and you decide what you're going to read and what assignments you're going to do and the internet. It's, all, it's all choice. Exactly. Um, but I think it's a fundamental responsibility of the faculty to present the student with an organized, deliberate, informed vision of what is most important to know in a given area. In general education, that's the task. You come and you sub subject yourself to the expertise, thoughtful, deliberate, critical, provisional um, uh, view of what is most important for you to be exposed in in general education. That is a decision that the student is not does not have the context, the expertise, the um, background, the knowledge to make in an informed way. Um, in fact, and and to refer to the Columbia program, um, what the Columbia program does, it has this core curriculum that everybody takes. Beyond that then you do make choices, right? You can choose your major, you can choose what courses you take in other areas, you can choose your professors, etc. And in fact, what the core curriculum does, it equips you to make more informed choices. So, you know, when you get a sense of what are the, the leading questions, the most important questions and debates that have shaped, say, our political institutions today, or what are the idioms in, and, and um, methods um, in the history of, you know, painting that um, get us to where we are today. Then if you're going to major in, pol in, in, in history or in politics or in philosophy or in art history, you have a frame, you have a um, kind of a, a, a lay, a map of the layout of the land on the basis of which you can make decisions. So I think that combining the expertise and responsibility and, and authority of a, of a faculty member um, with the capacity of students to make some choices um, is, is kind of the formula to go. That is that the part of what general education does is equips the students to make more informed choices, to um, abdicate that responsibility and put it on the student in the name of choice, in the name of autonomy, in the name of freedom, I think is, is a travesty and ultimately an abdication of our responsibility of faculty members. Well, I mean, one could also say that universities have gone way far in the direction of allowing everyone a, a million kinds of choice and actually right. turns out- And in fact, yeah. And in fact, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of moral cowardice. Like, you know, what better way to not have to deal with these questions of representation? Is my group being represented? Are these the right texts to read? Um, how much do we do with the past? How much do we do with the present? Do we talk about contempt? What 
better way to eliminate those questions, critiques, and debates than by just having no requirements at all. You, you, you choose, you do whatever you want, nobody, and then uh, you don't have to stand behind anything. You don't, have to, you don't have to defend or even work out a coherent vision of what education consists of. Yeah, and sort of giving into the, like, the larger kind of consumerist model of the economy in general. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it also is less satisfying, I think, that students, my, my sense is that students go through college and they get to the end and they say, I can't think of a class that I really hated, but I also can't think of a class that I really liked. And right. it's all like popcorn. Right. I can't even remember, quite remember what I was doing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And, you know, there's some interesting work, uh, kind of survey type work that, that shows, you know, that the, the paradox of choice is strongly operates in, 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 in uh, undergraduate um, curricular decisions. That is that having more choices, you always want more choices, but having more choices doesn't mean you end up happier with what you choose. In fact, there is a paradoxical relationship that often having more choices, which you want, leads to a less satisfactory decision, a uh, less, satis less satisfactory outcome. Um, students at Columbia, for example, tend to rave about the core curriculum. They're, they're always dissenters, but the bulk of the student body and especially alums, it's like a religion and, 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 and um, you often meet graduates of other institutions that say, oh my God, I wish, I, you know, 10 years out, I wish I had read this stuff. I wish I had had a core curriculum. I didn't when I was a student, but now that I, I wish I had had it. Um, so there is a, there, there's in fact a tremendous appreciation for the core curriculum at Columbia. You have, you have students who are much more satisfied with their curriculum than students in high, um, in high, uh, in low requirement environments where they get to do a lot of the choices. You just end up, the outcomes um, are, are, are really, really different. Yeah, okay. Here's a question from Preeta Gavil, who is uh, at an AU undergrad. If the study of the liberal arts is the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, how can a great books curriculum be effective if students themselves do not take an individual responsibility for their education? Many of my peers seem to come to college with a preconceived notion of what the world is like and with positions, both moral and political that they are convinced are correct and see no point in reading these texts that challenge their perspectives and, and dismiss their importance. How can such a cultural mindset be changed? Yeah, I mean, in a way that question sort of answers for comments comments on itself. I mean, the, the punchline of the question, how can a culture like that be changed? Like, I don't know. I, I, I try to teach my classes and talk about this and write about this in ways that advance the conversation, but um, uh, I don't know. Culture is so complex and there aren't any single levers that you can pull to make them go in another direction, but you can certainly um, throw your weight behind one or another direction. Um, and that's, um, you can be smart about it and have a greater impact or not, but, but um, that's, a, that's as much as you can do. Um, the, the question, you know, repeats some of the ground that the, that the previous question covered in that part of a liberal education is to expose you to a range of ideas and a range of debates about fundamental questions. And, and people often misconstru people often think that to you know, study the great books means that you are going to be indoctrinated into a set of answers, into a set of ideologies, into a set of like accounts that resolve the big questions. But in fact, there, that, that's not what happens. What you find is that you know, Aristotle disagrees fundamentally with Plato. And you read them both, and you've got no one to arbitrate. You, you know, they're they're not talking to each other. They're not. You don't get to see Plato and Aristotle debate. You have to make them debate in your own mind. You have to understand what they're saying, weigh what they're saying, put them together in your mind, and 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 um, enter the dialogue yourself. Um, that's what the, a liberal education is supposed to do. It's supposed to complicate and um, uh, expand the you know, your, 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 your horizon, your men mental horizon. Um, if, you, if you go through a liberal education and you don't change your mind or um, 
or your certainty isn't weakened, um, uh, I think the education hasn't worked. I think you, you, you have not had a liberal education if, um, if it doesn't accomplish that. Um, I guess one last thing I want to say on this question is that it does come back to the importance of a faculty, an institution, putting before the student the kinds of provocations that will trigger, that will invite and will cultivate this, this, this question. And again, that's what general education is there for to do. Um, it is, it is, that's, that's its job. We don't do that. We don't do that well. We, we mainly fail at doing that. Um, and as I said earlier, part of it is the organization of the university. Um, the, the, the mission of the university oriented towards research rather than teaching the structure of the academic career. Um, in any case, sometimes I've said this about the urban public school system. Like if you, if you look at, at most large public school systems, um, you can tell that the education is going to fail. You can tell that that education is going to fail most of its students. It's kind of failure by design. I kind of feel in a similar way about much of, of, of general education today. It is failure by design. It is, it is, it is if you see the way it's done, um, you can understand that it's not going to succeed. Okay, I have, uh, we have some, uh, I think we have uh, at least three questions that are on a similar theme. Uh, and so I'm gonna um, start with one from my colleague, Richard Shaw, who's a professor of literature here at American University. And he asks, the idea of the fundamentally human is itself a polarizing claim. Post-humanism, the idea of universality as, a, as necessary exclusion, the acceptance of relativism as a philosophical stance. So how to unite folks under this now divisive umbrella? What do you say to people who really disagree with the idea of the commonality? Yeah, um, well, you know, this is, I'm not the first to say this, that part of, part of the problem with like relativism is that it just, it's just another account of truth. You know, what, what is actually true is that there are no truths. What is actually true is that things are relative. Uh, you can't escape a grounding um, on some notion of what is an accurate account of the way things are. Uh, you can't escape that notion by simply, uh, by simple relativism. Uh, but is there such a thing as, as a kind of shared humanity? Is there such a thing as, a, as, a, as, a, as humanity? Well, I think that, that is one of, the, one of the great questions of liberal education. I think that, that asking that question, debating that question, examining it uh, is an important, uh, a, a crucial, a constitutive part of liberal education. Um, I don't, you know, I, uh, I think that there is a functional way in which commonality is obvious and undeniable. Um, you know, whether we can, we can make it into a kind of a metaphysical and, and, and we can turn it into an essence, you know, this is the essence, whether we can reduce it through philosophical investigation or argument into some essence. I, I, probably not, I don't really care. I don't think the question is that interesting, um, but there is a functional, there is, you know, again, it's kind of family resemblance. Re resemblance. There is a functional commonality uh, among us, uh, which is more than sufficient pragmatically in action, more than sufficient for us to um, uh, ask and debate the same fundamental questions. Um, the fact that we can debate whether there is a shared humanity uh, is itself an expression of the thing that we have in common. The fact that that question matters to us, the fact that we're able to ask that question and debate it. Uh, we are the kinds of beings that do that. Uh, we are the kinds of beings that in fact find fulfillment um, and have a kind of thirst and need to ask those kinds of questions. Um, so, um, you know, that question is more grist for the mill. That question and many other kinds of fundamental questions um, are precisely the, 
constituents of a liberal education. Hey, um, that was a left hook. Here comes a right hook. Um, this is for a question from Bob Nardo, who is a AU alum and, and now the uh, runs a school, a charter school in Memphis. Uh, he writes, everything you're saying about books is deeply resonating with me. That's the to be sure part. But if our defense of liberal education is predicated on freedom and the open-endedness of texts, how can we resist postmodernism radicalizing those claims? You know, um, I guess I just wouldn't use those terms like resisting postmodernism, right? Because let's, let's let's bring it on. Like postmodernism emerges out of philosophical investigation and debate and argument. And I'm, let's 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 get on. You know, let's take the fight outside or whatever. I'm ready to have those debates with postmodernism. Uh, I am ready to examine those questions. I am ready to take uh, postmodernism seriously. Where um, and you know. Part of that is postmodernism is probably afflicted more or as much as the worst of um, obfuscation and unclarity. Um, you know, there there is a lot. It's very hard to. There's a lot in postmodern theory that is uh, obfuscatory, impenetrable um, nonsense. Um, so you know, whatever. I am happy to. I'm, I'm happy to take it seriously, where it can be articulated in a in a way that can be um, understood and grasped. And 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 let's let's have the debate. You know, one one doesn't need to stamp it out or 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 um, you know ban it or something. Uh, no, let's bring it in. Let's have the debates. And of course, the the one of the ironies is the the great postmodern theorists are such deep, penetrating, profound readers of the great books. Um, and it, it's a beautiful example of how the tradition is kind of self undermining, like the way that you make it into, to, you know, to the canon, the way you make it into the canon is not by agreeing with everything somebody said in the past, it's by overturning, undermining, and the more effectively you can undermine and refute and overthrow them, then you're part of the club. Um, again, you know, we read Aristotle because he refutes Plato and, and um, we read Nietzsche because he refutes everybody. Um, that, that's the way that you get into the conversation is by offering these kinds of fundamental challenges. That's what the, that's what the tradition is about. Okay, uh, so here's here's a question on a different um, level. This is Sarah Marsh, our colleague from the Department of Literature. Uh, how do students of the liberal arts, undergraduates and faculty alike read texts? That is, what are they doing or trying to do with the text they study, even at the level of the sentence? It's a question about methodology, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, there, I think there are a lot of ways that one could answer that question. And, um, you know, the, there's a thing about, about when, you, when you teach in a kind of great books type of approach where you know one day you're doing Homer and the next day you might be doing Thoreau or something or 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 you know you're not sticking to one kind of book is that there is a way in which every book demands its own kind of reading, its own kind of investigation. Um, there isn't a pre-formulated key to that you just you know a method that you come and you and you apply to this book um so the way that you read homer is different than the way you read shakespeare or the way you read montaigne and um there is a a way in which as a teacher and as a reader you let the book teach you how to read it um you respond to the demands that the book makes on you as a reader. Getting less theoretical than that, um, or less vague than that, um, you know, there is there is a there is a level of reading that we do as teachers. You know, if you if you read if you read Kant, Kant is an example because Kant is so difficult. Uh, if you read, you know groundwork to the metaphysics of morals or the critique of pure reason or um, 
whatever, there is a, to teach a, one of those books in a general education course, and probably the critique of fewer reason by sheer length is not viable for a general education course. Um, but take something like the groundwork to the metaphysics of morals, which is of a scale that is digestible, incorporatable into a general education course. That text is so complex and so difficult and so kind of abstruse. Kant is so um, difficult to understand. He he has like such specialized concepts um, that a big part of reading that book is simply having a sense of what Kant is trying to say. Just having a a a, a um, parsing of the logical structures of the argument. That 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 takes you a long way as a teacher, just doing that. Um, then once you do that, you can go into you know deeper questions about the actual claims that are made, about the actual um, process of argumentation, about the metaphysical premises that he, that, that, that Kant assumes, et cetera. Um, so there is a way in which there are certain texts that simply demand from the teacher in a classroom a kind of, um, parsing, a kind of clarification. Um, and then of course, the way you read like a literature text might be quite different than the way you read um, a philosophical text. The way you read a play might be different than the way you read uh, a, a lyric. Um, anyway, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rambling about that, but those are some thoughts about what you're trying to do with the book. Oh, and here's the, the other thing, of course, because what, what you're trying to do in the end in a liberal arts classroom is to um, see how this book addresses fundamental questions that come with the territory of your own experience of humanity, right? It's, it's trying to get at the ways in which this book in some ways enriches, complicates, stimulates our thinking about our very specific condition of being a human being here today. Okay, so we have a couple of questions about um, uh, uh, about accessibility uh, and maybe I'll read one. This is Grace Weinberg who writes, if the common core liberal arts education of which you speak highly is only available at more selective and expensive institutions like the Ivy Leagues and even American University, to what extent is this limited accessibility counterproductive to the ultimate goal of democratizing or diversifying narratives and upholding a common goal? Yeah, I think it's absolutely uh, debilitating to the possibility of, of democracy. And I should say that this kind of education is not, um, the way that, that where you can find this kind of education does not track along the line of prestige and wealth in the academy. Um, some of the very prestigious schools and very wealthy schools do not have good liberal education. And some small schools, um, sometimes even obscure schools have very good liberal education. So it doesn't precisely track along the, the ladder of, um, of academic prestige. Um, but the general point about the fact that um, to the extent that this kind of education is not accessible to uh, the broad population, it undermines the possibilities for democracy. Um, it, it, a democracy depends, I mean, almost kind of, it's kind of like tautological to say it, but a democracy depends on the capacity of the people to self-govern, the capacity of the, of the members of the democracy to uh, exercise self self governance to manage their freedom well to you know governance is a complicated thing you know laws and policy and war and the economy and 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 collective action they are things that require engagement and cultivation they require critical tools they require perspective they require information they require deliberateness they require the capacity to dialogue to listen to others opinions to weigh evidence to discriminate uh, between between um, competing alternatives and competing accounts all of these skills all of these um, human capacities are cultivated and polished in liberal education classrooms they're not the only way that you get them far from it you know they're they're clear you can you get those and most people get them to some extent somewhere else but that is the point of general education 
to equip every student with those with those capacities and those capacities are absolutely necessary to the functioning of a democracy i think that part of our political crisis at the moment uh and it, which is not a new crisis i think that's been building and we are we you know we're in a bad bad place and part of it is that our the population the american population um is under edu under liberal edu educated i think that that the information revolution for example has provided us with a discursive challenge a the degree of discursive complexity that uh, we have not, as a population, been able to uh, digest, I've been able to metabolize, I've been able to adapt to. Um, so we are at the moment, as a society, really having a hard time with telling like tr truth from fiction, from weighing evidence, from uh, determining what is, what is credible information. Uh, what is con conspiratorial nonsense like just we 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 do not have the discursive sophistication to uh meet the chat the discursive challenges that our information environment presents to us and it that is a failure of liberal education okay uh so i have to say we're not going to get to all the questions and so for if you asked a question and we didn't get to it uh i apologize uh it wasn't because your question was bad it's just because we're running out of time um i have a question um from my colleague alan levine who asks many europeans are contemptuous of the united states cultural achievements and the west is generally contemptuous of the rest of the world's cultural achievements except perhaps for a handful of really old texts such as the bhagavad gita or confucius can you speak about some great books that speak to people across space and time that were produced by one Americans and two uh, traditions from writers in Africa or Latin America? Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, issues with America, you know, was I, now I can remember if this conversation was in, in this in this discussion or in the in the previous one, but um, yeah, I think it was in the previous one, but um, one of the tests for a book's capacity to address fundamental questions to many, many different kinds of people is whether you can do that over a long period of time um, to different and changing historical circumstances. So the older a book is, the easier it is to, to, to demonstrate or to see or to, or to establish the fact that, that it can do this. Um, the, 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 the more recent the book is, the less evidence we have that it will be, a, you know, the less certain we can be that it will last, that it will prove to be the kind of book that illuminates um, questions that matter to people, many different kinds of people are long, over a long period of time. So there is a thing about America, that America is so young that, you know, you are not, we're not going to have and can't have a Homer or, or a Shakespeare. Um, but you know we can have a Melville and we can have a Whitman, or we can have an Emerson, we can have a Thoreau, we can have a Frederick Douglass. Um, you know, thinking more contemporary, we can have a um, a Toni Morrison or a Ralph Ellison um, or a James Baldwin. I think all of these are are writers, artists, and I you know I was just and I'm thinking of African Americans in particular, which is a a, a, a literature that I know well. Um, but all of those are, are texts and, and um, objects that I think have that capacity to speak across, um, across radically different versions of the human experience. They are able to, to translate their peculiarity into terms that are broadly accessible and compelling to people. You know, Toni Morrison can, can write about the legacy of slavery and the individual psychological experiential consequences of slavery in a way that somebody who has no connection to to slavery um, can 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 feel can understand can grasp can can, can experience and that's what makes um, what makes it an important book in this category um, wherever human beings are producing things uh, works of art works of fiction, um, objects, this thing is going to come. It is not culturally confined. It is not civilizationally determined. Um, uh, I, you know, I know a little bit of, of, of um, kind of 
Indian and, and Eastern other, other Asian texts to know that there is a huge wealth over there. Um, you know, you mentioned in the question, uh, the Gita and, and um, I forget what other, but, but um, whether it's Mencius or, or Lao Tzu or, or you know, Basho in, 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 in Japan, um, there's an extraordinary wealth of material um, of, this, of this sword. Um, there is an, an advantage in, say, in a, in a, in a, in a society, in a, in a society that has been strongly shaped by the Western tradition, such as ours. There is a tremendous advantage to understanding that lineage. Um, and I think if you're in a, in a contemporary Asian society, there will be an equal advantage to understanding that, that lineage. Um, so I, I, I think that there is some justification for a Western heavy curriculum in Western general education courses, but not exclusively. It's, 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 it's not a, you know, it's not, it's not because it's Western. Um, it's because it, it, it's significance on our contemporary, on our contemporary culture yet especially today when we are a moment of uh, rapid and, and, and you know, unique global integration. At a moment in human history, we have more and accelerated more of that, uh, that, I think, that, that I think part of a liberal education ought to include some significant encounters with these uh, lineages of thought that are not Western. I think there's something so powerful about, you know, like I, I teach Gandhi, uh, often in the context of general education. And there was something so powerful about encountering a thinker that is thinking about the ethical and political issues that we have spent, you know, we spent the whole whole year thinking about in, in, in the core, who's thinking about them from ethical, philosophical, cosmological premises that are like really different than the ones we than the ones in the Western tradition. It's so illuminating and so powerful. So I, I do think that there is tremendous value and need for um, the incorporation of these uh, of these other traditions into a liberal education, with still um, a strong kind of more traditional Western orientation, given that we are living in a Western society. Well, Roosevelt, I feel you've been you've talked about our common humanity, and I feel that my common humanity compels me to end this session, not because <laughs> we've said everything that needs to be said. Uh, and not because we're tired of talking to you, uh, but uh, I happen to know that you've been Zooming all day and that this is not your last Zoom event of, of the day. And you'll get a Medal of Honor for fighting in the Zoom wars. <laughs> uh, so um, I think out of, out of mercy to you, we need to um, call it a night. But Roosevelt, you know, it's, it's so important, the work that you're doing and um, that, that it speaks to many of us in many surprising parts of the university. And so uh, I just hope that you know that we're, we're really grateful for, for number one, for your being here, but also just for your uh, ability to, to be a spokesman for the, the tradition that you're speaking for. So thank you, Thomas. Uh, great pleasure to be here and to meet some of your students and to get some of these really, really good questions that I've gotten. Good. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll see you next time. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.